Welcome everybody to Living on Purpose Podcast, where your hosts James Hagler and Jason Wilson. Our guest today is Mark Pattison, former NFL player, philanthropist, podcaster, keynote speaker, and successful entrepreneur. He's currently an executive at Sports Illustrated and has now climbed all seven summits, having completed this feat by scaling the death-defying Mount Everest in the spring of 2021. Welcome, everybody, to Living on Purpose Podcast. We're your host, James Hagler, and myself, Jason Wilson. Today, our special guest is Mark Pattison. Welcome to the show, brother. How you doing? Doing Welcome. great. It's a pleasure to have you, man. Uh, hey, I appreciate that. You know, I always love talking about this, this different stuff. And, you know, if anybody wants to listen to my story, then I'm happy to share it. But, you know, I have experienced some amazing things. And, you know, it hasn't come from luck or chance or, you know, I won the lottery. It's come from a lot of hard work. But, you know, we can get into that. But there has certainly been a formula to the, the recipe. And, uh, you know, love to chat it up with you guys today and see where it goes. Awesome, man. We, we cannot wait to get into your story. Uh, but, man, how does your story start? What was your childhood dream? That's a great question. You know, it, it, it happened so long ago that, you know, back in the day, it was really just growing up. I was your, your typical kid, you know, growing up um, in the Northwest in Seattle, Washington. You know, a lot of mountains that surrounded up there. And, you know, there weren't all these select sports and club teams and uh, lacrosse and, and so on and so forth. It was just really the big three. And the big three were basketball, baseball, and football. And so, um, you know, you didn't spend full a year on one sport. You just go from sport to sport based on the season. And so, you know, back in the day, that's what I did. I lived right across the street from a play field, and I was on it all the time in a T-shirt pouring down rain, 50 degrees, and I didn't think anything different. I didn't get on my first airplane until I was 18 years old on a recruiting trip to the University of Hawaii. So, I mean, that's just, you know, times have changed so much with the internet and how easy travel can be. And it seems like we're way more connected. Jason, I think you're in some remote, remote part of the world. Uh, and, and, you know, we're sitting here talking. I'm in Sun Valley. James, I'm not sure where you're, you're anchored right now. But, um, you know, it really was that. You know, I, 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 I didn't think big enough. And I think that's part of the story is about really trying to think big, right? Because when you think big, it opens up your possibility. And back then I was just, I, I couldn't even see myself playing at the University of Washington, um, which was, you know, 10 minutes from my house. I could hear the stadium. I got to go to all the games growing up and I was idolized those guys, but certainly never saw myself as one of those people because I just didn't grow up. My parents were, you know, school teachers. They were amazing people, but you know, you just, you didn't, you had three channels, CBS, NBC, ABC, and the PBS channel, four channels. There yeah. wasn't ESPN, there wasn't all these things. And that didn't really come till later, right? When I actually started to excel in high school, and then I started to see some success um, there, and then, of course, in college, and in the NFL. So um, where, 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 were you, where were you living at this time? Where, uh, what state? Yeah, so again, you know, if you, you know, the geography of, of Seattle in the state of Washington and uh, within Seattle is University of Washington, you know, huge school. Uh, we just recently went over to the Big Big Ten. We've been in the Pac-12. Uh, it was the Pac-10 back in the day. And so I didn't really go anywhere outside of when I started traveling with the University of Washington. We'd go down to Southern California to play UCLA or USC or to the Bay Area to play Stanford or Cal. I really didn't start traveling until I started traveling with the Huskies. And so I was really anchored for, you know, until I was like 18 years old, always been in, being in Seattle and never going outside. We didn't have the, really the, the finances, you know, the way it all worked out. And we had a little VW bug that we travel around in and, Again, there weren't club teams and you weren't traveling with your kid to Texas and Tennessee and these other places where they have these big club sports. It's just a different, different time period. Well, yeah, the reason why I was asking is I, I, I grew up in uh, Massachusetts, Brockton, Massachusetts. And I could relate to you when you said how you played the sports with the different seasons. That's the same way how I grew up the same, same way. When basketball season was, was, was on, we were playing basketball. When football season was on, we were playing football. When baseball season came out, we were playing baseball. So we just walked with the different seasons as well. 
So I, I can relate to that uh, uh, as well when you said that. That was, was fascinating because nowadays kids don't do that. We used to go outside and, and play all day. Had to be had to be home before the uh, the lights come on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and and you know, like, I mean, I, I think there's a couple things with that. Is number one is that you see, you know, so many more injuries today. I think, uh, you know, like baseball and younger kids, just because they're not having their body go this way and go that way. And and James, even you know, remember watching, you know, it's kind of MMA today, but it used to be boxing. And right. even I don't even know where a boxing, you know, gym, you know, was, but. You know, when they would have on ABC Wired World of Sports with Jim McKay and they'd have Hagler Hearns and, and yeah, you know, all those um, all those other great fighters and all Lee and those things, you know, it was just the thing to see and watch. I didn't participate in those sports, um, but it was just interesting that just or the way that we consume content to the way that we you know, consume content today with all this streaming stuff going on and all these channels that we've, it seems like we have 300 channels that you can pick from. Um, it's just amazing the way things have evolved over time in sports, where we view them, the way we play them. Yeah, absolutely, man. So my son, you know, speaking of, of having access to all these different kinds of uh, ways of training and nutrition and things that you have access to through social media, uh, none of that existed when we were kids. So who did you idolize as a professional player? Gosh, you know, one of the guys, and, you know, a lot of these guys I got to meet, you know, either play with or meet, you know, in my time, just the, the space I ultimately would find myself in. Um, but, you know, you, you know, initially at the University of Washington, I just had my eyes kind of keen on that. In 1976, um, I think it was they brought in the Tampa Bay Buccaneers and the Seattle Seahawks. Those were the two franchises at that time. And and a guy that, you know, I I loved watching was a guy named Steve Largen. And so okay. he's a crafted little white receiver that could get all over the field. And that's, you know, what I turned out to be as a receiver um, as well. And so I really loved watching him. Ironically, and I feel weird saying this, but Back in the day when USC was dominating, you know, the, the gridiron in college football, um, John McKay was the coach and OJ Simpson was like, you know, everybody wanted to be OJ, right? And then OJ has this insane, crazy career. He was a phenomenal football player. He was a brilliant broadcaster. He had a great career going with NBC. And then all the wheels came off, of course. We all know about that. But um, you know, back in the day, that's kind of what it was. It was USC versus Washington and OJ Simpson. And I'm going to be the tailback, you know, type of thing. Okay. So you, you came out, uh, of college and you were drafted in the seventh round. No. I mean, did, did you have any hope that you were going to be drafted when, when it got, uh, that far in the draft? Well, it's a good question because when I came out of high school, you know, I was, I was, I was really good in high school, but, and I could dominate, but I never did anything. I never worked at it, right? It was just natural talent. I could just outrun everybody really, really uh, was faster than everybody else. And I had good hand-eye coordination. And then when I got to the University of Washington, um, I was so far in over my head. And I was looking out there, and all these other guys were, you know, gunned up and were confident and were powerful. They'd been in the system. They'd been in the program for a number of years, and I just hadn't done any of that. And so – I really had to commit and it, you know, I just, it was a big wake up call for me because it was kind of like, what door do you want to walk through? Do you want to walk through this door or do you want to really buckle up? And that meant a lot of sacrifice. i moved out of my place. I was living on campus, moved back here with my parents. I didn't go to the parties. I mean, I just had a radical shift in life and that's what if you want to achieve big things in life. I found it takes tremendous amount of sacrifice and discipline to make that happen. But the rewards have been there, right? And so it took me to, like three years to get on the field. And I finally did. And, you know, I was in the right place at the right time. I had built up my confidence. Um, and so now I'm taking on the first game I got to start against was Michigan, right? And I happened to catch a, a, a touchdown in the last second to win the game. I'm on Sports Illustrated. It was amazing. And then my career really started to take off, off after that. It was also a moment in time where I was competing against USC, multiple uh, 
uh, NFL players that would go on to the NFL prospects, uh, UCLA, Stanford, again, Michigan, who played Oklahoma, all these, all these teams. And so I, I got to a point where, you know, I was like, you know what, I can be with these guys. And those guys were making it, and I think I might have a shot. And then, you know, they, they still have – There's you can't just go try out for the Raiders, right? There's a system in place, and that usually starts with the combine. So they, they rank you and they take the top 300 players around the country to the combine, and I got invited to the combine. Ironically, the same year – Jerry Rice got uh, invited. So we were in the combine running around together in the, in the, in the receiver group. And, um, you know, then you're starting to get some indicators of, you know, you're going to go between, you know, this and that. And I got all those things and agents were coming after me. So I was pretty confident that I was going to get drafted. But I also took that attitude of I'm just grateful whatever round I get taken in. So I'm not going to be disappointed by having the expectations that if I'm not drafted by the fifth round or something, that, you know, it's a, it's a bust. I mean, anything was fine with me. It was just getting there and then buckle up and just figure out how you can make the team. And the hard thing about the NFL, which a lot of guys have to talk about, it's so flipping hard to make an NFL roster. It's even harder to stay there. Right. It says you've got new dudes coming in all the time, new draft picks, trades people are getting cut and it's super stressful wow well, so go ahead jason go ahead. <laughs> so you were competing with people like jerry rice okay so what was your 40 time uh i ran a four or five yeah oh, okay. yeah so that's that's and, and i ran it on grass which is usually a tenth slower so, um, you know, I was moving and, and I could run and, but there's so much of the game. So, you know, Jerry, I don't think ran much faster than what I ran, but he was just such a great gamer and he was in such a great system of the San Francisco 49ers. And they were really starting to open up and being innovative with that West coast offense. So he was putting four receivers out on the field and one, two, three, go one, two, three, go. So the quarterback, Joe Montana was never getting sacked. We played them every year with the Saints because we were in the AFC West, which never met, uh, made sense. They had the Rams and the 49ers, you know, AFC West, which would indicate the West Coast. But then also in the same division were the Saints and the Falcons. So we'd all have to fly this way every year versus, you know, being in the same conference as the 49ers or something, which would make much more sense. Or, I'm sorry, the Seahawks, you know. Arizona made no sense. Yeah. So uh, – so um, I hear you say that you know you say you say you, you was good and you and you, you just was really solid and good. I just want to know like what was your, your 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 mindset on on being the best? Well, that's a really good question, um, and the answer is I think my coach, like a lot of people today, don't know who Don James was because he passed away ten plus years ago and. You know, he was then and the coaches are today. And but what he did for me is he taught me about this thing about the pyramid of success. It's about how you achieve things in life and very structured. So there's essentially 25 things. And John Wooden had originally talked about that. And he was a legendary coach at UCLA, a basketball coach. And so, you know, by by looking and visualizing where you need to be, and then the very top, you know, as the pyramid goes like this and, and it gets steeper and steeper. Your ultimate goal for us back in the day was the Rose Bowl, because that's where the Pac-10, you know, would would end up the winner of that division. So in order to do that, you had to win the uh, the Pac-10. So you, if you won the Pac-10, then you'd automatically go to the Rose Bowl, and then ultimately you want to win the Rose Bowl. And then above that is winning the national championship. So there was this whole structure towards trying to really focus and narrow where you're going to be to turn your mindset into a championship mindset with confidence that you know where you're going with a clear roadmap. Now, interesting, everybody knows who Nick Saban is, right? The kid, the, the famous Alabama coach who recently retired. Nick Saban was a graduate assistant coach under my head coach, Don James, back in the day. So all these things that he's talking about, how to win, how to get better, how to strive, how to create that mindset, how to create that pyramid of success, came from my coach, Don James, back in the day. And you can see what that did for, for Coach Nick Saban, who I think now is on ESPN. Well, yeah, the reason why I was asking is because 
I heard you say uh, something that that I could definitely relate to. When I was amateur boxing, and um, you know, when I, I I've always had skills because I was taught real real young how to box. The only thing about me was that I couldn't compete because my dad didn't want me to compete. Mm. So so he kind of stripped me of that amateur having that amateur um, background. So when I got old enough, like 21 years old, I started competing. And when I just was going through the amateur race, like it was nothing. I made the regionals just the four amateur fights that I fought in four tournaments. And some of the other fighters was like, you know, like uh, Rasheed Wells and uh, Lehman Brewster. It was all like, how do you get here so fast? And I knew I couldn't answer the question. You know, and then my roommate was telling me, he explained to me, he said, well, look, you know, it, it took a long time to get to where you are. And I was like, well, I've already, I already knew how to fight. So once I got there, I was pretty good. But then I learned that once you get up to those regional stages with those guys, you have to be in shape. I was never in shape. I just knew how to fight and I was mean with it because my dad taught me just how to be the best at it. Whatever you do, just be the best at it. You know, and the only thing that I did not listen to is, is, is you have to work hard to stay there. And so when I started climbing that ladder, because I could have went to the Olympics, but when I got to that point, it was it was it was it was crazy, man. <laughs> Those guys were really fighting. You had to be the same. You didn't forget about skills. So uh, when you were saying that, I was like, wow. I didn't. I never heard anybody. I never ran into anybody that had that. that you know, had something similar to uh, my experience. So there was something specifically. I want to want to tell you what I was talking to Don James. I pulled this up the other day from our pyramid of success, and this is what motivated people. The characteristics. All right. Number one, there's only five, this will be short, are self-starters. Number two, accept accountability. Three, never pass the buck. Four, look for solutions, not excuses. Five, move forward with dignity. And as a result, you develop a winning attitude. And so that can be part of the formula to get anybody. And the, the thing that's great about this is this has helped me so much in business and other things I've tried to achieve. Um, Jason, you mentioned, you talked about the seven summits, climbing Mount Everest and things like that. But, you know, that's not like a team thing. And there's, I guess there's no winner or loser. It's not like you're playing against another climber, you know, to who, but the, the, the personal uh, and the, the, the personal accountability of nobody has to tell me to get up. I just know that when I look in the mirror, have I done everything I can do to potentially fulfill my potential, my ceiling of where I can go in life and try to achieve these different things. Hmm. Most definitely, I can relate to that. My dad was like that. That, you know, every, a lot of everything you said when you name off those five things, my dad was all, all that, you know what I mean? He was, he, I mean, he was something, I, I, I've asked him, I said, hey, you know, you know how, how do you get there? He's like, well, I want it more than anything. So that came first. And I knew when to say when, and I just put my mind to it, and I stayed focused, and I never lost. I never lost uh, track of, of the prize. He kept his eyes on the prize. So when you say about climbing Mount Everest, it, it's, it's interesting because I know with my dad, it was hard. Even when we were playing around, we didn't play. Was, he was very competitive. He wouldn't let you beat him at nothing. <laughs> so, so I understand what you're talking about. To have that mindset to climb that mountain, I can see my dad right there with you. Just keep moving. Oh, you're hurting. Oh, don't worry about it. We'll cut that thing off. Keep moving. You, you must succeed, and you gotta, you, you gotta get to, you gotta get to the top. Well, so I, 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 I bet you, you, you know, your, your dad was like this, and many of the top guys he he boxed against were like this, but. Um, you know, how you do something is how you do everything. How you exactly. do something is how you do everything. And for, for me, that starts every single morning. And I'm way past my prime, right? But I just know that I can continue to achieve. I just got off the Iger, which is in Switzerland. It was in Matterhorn before that, Mont Blanc before that. So every year I'm going after these new challenges. That I get, but every single morning at 5.30 a.m. with a in the pitch black with a headlamp, I'm in the, I live out in the country, in the mountains, and I've got a headlamp on and my feet are on the floor and I am moving out into the trail up on the mountain every single morning, seven days a week, year round, right? Whether it's snowing, whether it's sleeting, whether it's raining, and that helps you then build that strong mindset that you need when you go and you take these big challenges like I'm sure your dad did. 
Oh yeah, that you know, strengthening your will. That's what it is. Because my dad ran 15 miles, right? So, and everybody in the boxing world thought he was nuts for running 15 miles. So I, I had to ask him. I said, Dad, why you know what's the business about 15 miles? He said, I didn't run 15 miles for uh to be for enduring. He said, I ran 15 miles because sometimes when you win that fight and it gets tough, you gotta push. So when I'm running 15 miles, I start out saying, Hey, I'm gonna run 10, and then I said, Well, let's do another five. And I push and I and I train my mind to push. And I, I'm gonna, I don't care if it's snowing out, I don't care if it's raining out. We went to the we went to the um to the gym to work out during the blizzard of uh 78 in Massachusetts. Yeah. And he and we walked, we walked halfway there and then and then um one of the cuts another came and picked us up. Like he was just very determined about that, man. So I mean it's it's funny that I'm having this conversation. Yeah, yeah, I know. I love it. I mean, there's so much crossover in these things. So, you know, these aren't these aren't like whatever bark you know comes out of my mouth isn't like the Bible. It's just that I've had so much experience in business, in sport, in climbing mountains, in making you know this film, uh, and and you know, Sports Illustrated that it, it, I've used the exact same approach on every single thing. It's been my formula to success. So. That's where I, I'm so passionate about some of the things that come out of my mouth is just because I know that they work. And the only difference between me and many others that are out there that wish they could do this or that, or they say, Mark, you're lucky or whatever. I go, okay, whatever. But I don't see anybody out there. I train three hours a day. And I don't see anybody else out there on the trail with me. You're, everybody's welcome to join me, but nobody ever does, right? I'm the only fucking guy that's out there. And that's not a big deal to me. Like if somebody wants to sleep in, go for it. But that's what I know I have to do to succeed and win. Well, Mark, okay, you had four successful seasons in the NFL, and uh, you transitioned to mountain climbing. Uh, what was the motivation? Well, I, I would say it wasn't quite in that order, but I, I would say the through line has been – I think that when a lot of people get done playing, especially at a high level in whatever sports they're in, and I've, I was just with some professional baseball players that you would know this weekend, uh, I was flew in for a Raider event and you know, you get to kind of the end of that rope and you've been doing it for such a long time. That you, most of the guys just quit. And I was, I went out to dinner with a, uh, with a, uh, with a teammate um, famous kicker, and he's going through some weight struggles and some alcohol struggles, and, and it was just like, would you please tell me like the formula? And so I went through it, but at the end of the day, you know, it become it's all on, on you know the individual to do this. And so after after football, the NFL, I, I continued to train, and I've never quite stopped. Now maybe I wasn't going as intense, like eight hours a day, but then I started to get into the business world, and I started a couple of venture back companies that. That one was sold, and ultimately that kind of weaved up into when the internet, you know, came around of getting uh, working with the sports outlet, and then ultimately taking over uh, Sports Illustrated. But it was about ten years ago that I was going through a rough patch, and man, we all go through rough patches, right? And this one hit me pretty hard. It was just like, how am I going to pull myself out of this deep hole? And so, you know, I was just like, I kind of retreated back to that one space that I've always succeeded at, was, which was sports. And so I said, I got to do something big and I can't be going back to the NFL and, and playing. I'm not a boxer. There's a lot of things I can't do. So what can I do? And since I grew up in the Northwest, it was like, I'm going to see if any NFL players ever climbed the seven summits. I went back to my home. I Googled it. No, no guy had done that. I said, I am going to be that person. So 10 years ago, off on this journey, I went to become the first NFL player to climb the seven summits. And I was like, well, how do I do this? And so I started training and I moved to this mountain town, Sun Valley, Idaho, here in the middle of Idaho. And I got a roadmap in the pyramid of success on where I need to start it with Mount Kilimanjaro down in Tanzania. I've actually done it twice now. Um, and start down there and then we my way through. And of course, at the time I thought, oh, you know, seven mountains, uh, seven years. And again, the seven highest mountains are on each continent. So there's seven continents. So that's where you get the, so in, in Asia, it's Mount Everest in North America. 
It's Denali in South America. Jason, I think you're coming somewhere. It's in Argentina. Um, yeah. so you just kind of go around the globe doing that. And, you know, I got a roadmap. I understood what I had to do at competitive greatness, you know, go at this thing with gusto and full passion and commitment with daily discipline and get after that thing and see what happened. And of course, COVID came in. I was on Denali. I got in minus 90 degree weather in 2017 or yeah, 2017. So I had to retreat, come back again the next year, redo that whole thing. I was able to, uh, to climb it, but you know, things get in the way, but ultimately I was able to achieve and I continue every year. Like I said, I, I keep going after these new mountains and new challenges. That's awesome, man. <laughs> okay. So uh, tell us about your journey with Sports Illustrated. Uh, well, yeah, as we all know, Sports Illustrated is an iconic brand, right? And, you know, it's been around for 56 years or more originally as a magazine. We used to, at least I did, and got that magazine growing up as a kid. And I was bl very blessed that I was in the magazine five different times in different ways. Um, and then about seven years ago, uh, there was an opportunity to take over Sports Illustrated and run that from an executive you know, side. And so at that time, I was looking at the way they created content and they'd always done this long form journalism. And I came into the picture and I was like, we need to just, uh, stir things up. And so I want to create a bunch of team sites. So I, I have a person that in every single market, every NFL market, college market, NBA, uh, major, major League Baseball. And rather than have long form journalism, as you're seeing newspapers, magazines shut down, I said, we're going to start giving people what they want, which is short snippets of video and just the bottom line. What happened last night in the Yankee Dodger, you know, World Series game, right? That's it. That's what people want to know. And so it turns out there is a magic, magical formula within that. And so our, we call it on SI, on Sports Illustrated, um, has completely blown up. And it's been a massive success. And took the company when I first got there. Sports Illustrated was ranked 17, ESPN number one. Sports Illustrated number 17. Now we are number one, ESPN is number two. Now ESPN still dominates the sports space on TV. But now I'm talking about the digital footprint that we have in this space, uh, CBS Sports, we're ahead of ESPN, we're, we're ahead of USA Today, we're ahead of all these major media companies. It's amazing to be a part of that ride. Uh, yeah, my dad, my, my dad was on the Sports Illustrated numerous of time. I think he was like, uh, other than Ali, he was like one of the most photographic uh, boxes that was uh, ever on uh, Sports Illustrated. Yeah, we have something, it, it, it's insane to see. We have something called the Vault. And the vault is this collection of iconic covers or pictures, you know, over the years. Ali, I'm sure your dad, you know, Hagler's on there. Hearns is probably on the Macho Hector, whatever his name is. You know, because, yeah, they're, they're all on there, right? In, or within there somewhere. And, and so to be able to, you know, see all those photos up front the first time was just like I, I was pinched myself like this. This can't be real. I'm actually part of this right now. And I, and I, I wonder where uh, you guys still have a magazine or. Yeah. You know? yeah. Yeah. We, we cut it down from four times producing four times a month um, to one time a month. Um, but uh, magazines making a comeback. It's great. I, I see that they slowly, it's slowly, uh, they slowly, uh, most definitely. I like, I like the magazines. I used to go, we used to go to the stores all the time and just get the ring magazines, the sports illustrated. Yeah. Used to always, yeah, and then one day it just stops. <laughs> no, uh, you can't. Oh, not, you know, that's all changing. We're back. So, uh, uh, no, that's good. Well, since you've been at Sports Illustrated, Mark, um, you know, do you still have ties to the NFL? Do you still? Do events or what yeah, do you do with so, the NFL? No, so uh, that, that's a multi-pronged question. So personally, you know, since I played for the Raiders, they have a really strong Raider alumni. So I was just at a, a at a golf event last weekend in Las Vegas, and then I was at the game against the Steelers. And you know, they have a bunch of us go sweet to sweet to sweet, shaking hands, kissing babies. It's great. It's great PR for everybody, and I love doing it. So I'm very blessed that way. Uh, as, as far as Sports Illustrated, obviously we're covering all the NFL teams. So um, I have my my 
my finger on on all the different transactions that are going on and I'm in contact with all the publishers. Um, I'm, I'm still part of the NFL Players Association based out of New York. And then we also have a deal with the NFL where we're taking certain NFL content and putting it on. So somebody will write about the 49ers and you might see a video about, you know, the quarterback or one of the running backs or something on there. Okay. So in your opinion, man, um, is the NFL doing enough to help players with mental health issues like PTSD, yeah. suicidal ideation, anxiety, depression? Yeah. So I'll tell you what happened is, you know, back in the, the age of days when I played, um, you know, there was nothing. And so when you stopped, you stopped and there was no, and literally you went off a cliff and there was no support, no help. And then uh, a good 10 years ago, there's there's a gal named Tracy Perlman who came along and she, she wanted to uh, phrase something called the trust. And essentially that was for uh, the, the NFL Players Association for that group of players, 10,000 plus players that are in this group of like, what do you do when you get, you know, you come out of the league. And so they've, they, we have, you know, anywhere from, uh, you know, CTE, um, I'm dealing with that. I'm going to a uh, all NFL paid. I'm going to have this two day uh, health check in Newport Beach here next month. Um, they, you can go and you can mentor with you know financial people if you want to be a Merrill Lynch or something like that, or be on Wall Street. You could go, um, you know, learn how to do that. Be a broadcaster. Be a coach. Um, you know, it's just a whole range of things that they offer all the different programs, um, as well as health benefits that just didn't exist when I came out. And um, I wish I would have had that. It would have given me direction. I was lost for probably two years. Like, what do I do? I have all this energy, but I, I'm only skilled to catch a football. I don't know how to do anything else. And I'm 30 years old and I felt like a total loser, right? And so there's a lot of guys out there in that situation. Even if they made a bunch of money, you got to have purpose in life. What are you going to do the rest of your life? Right. And so um, I, I think they've done just an outstanding job making that happen and um uh, you know that's that's one thing about boxing too i think a lot of fighters uh nowadays they're starting to get in and branch out and understand that they're you know that they're that they're their uh their own boss you know what i'm saying so to speak so and for them i think they used to get a lot of help as well of, of what to do when you retire yeah you know my dad was just you know once he retired he got into trouble with the whole thing i mean and he just, and it was real difficult for him to make that transition to go from, um, you know, boxing all the time to not doing anything. So he had to really, you know, get his mind together, get that mindset. So that this is one of the reasons why he moved to uh, you to just get the, you know, get himself together. And he did what dabbed in, in movies and things of that nature. But, you know, my thing, we thought as a family, as you know, being the kids, we thought he was gonna come back and put time into us, but he didn't. And he just kept it, he just kept going. He, you know, in, in his retirement days, it was just about him, his wife, and it's, we came like we, we became like uh distant relatives. We were once family, but then we became distant relatives. And I come to find out later on in life that reason why he doesn't have a book, I mean, reason why he doesn't have a book or or movies about himself is because he said it was it was too painful to go down memory lane. So if he, if he had these programs, like you said, that, that exist that could have helped him, you know, deal with that, deal with those pains, if things could have been different. Yeah, I mean, look, it, it's hard for any athlete. I don't think it's just football, like you're talking about in boxing, NBA, you know, when, when you've done one thing and done it really well. And on top of that, you have all the adulation you know, all when he'd go to the ring, you know, with me, I had a helmet on, I was in front of millions of people, but they're a way out there. When you're boxing, it's just you and, and you know, whoever else who's boxing gets right there, everybody knows your face. And it's just hard to walk away from that, uh, let alone being thrown out the door. Um, and all that attention and that kind of money and all the other stuff that go with it seem to go away. And so it's a hard transition if you're not really focused on how do I, transition but for me it was really being able to take that same energy and apply it somewhere else i just need some guidance on how to get me to that next spot right. hmm. i think i think they i think all athletes need that like you said all athletes they need that guidance they, they have to you know they have to really think about it. they think about it as much back in the day as they do now 
for sure, for sure. So, you know, it's just like we talked about the beginning of this conversation. There's so much that has changed and evolved over the period of time, you know, from, and it's great to see, it seems like it's, it's moving in a much more healthy space um, for people to get support and, and uh, learn and hopefully transition to what, you know, whatever you're gonna do. But one thing I, I for sure had to get over is that I mean, for there was a period of time and there was like, okay, what is it gonna be really just like drive me in the same kind of passion I had where, you know, I'm up in there and I'm catching the ball in the last second over Michigan or, you know, Oklahoma or something. You won the, the you're on sports social. And the reality is, is none of that, that, that doesn't exist in the business world. You may have some big wins, um, but usually those big wins, like if you're a developer or something, it takes you time to build and get the contracts and da, da, da. It's not in the moment of when those things happen, which makes sports so exciting. So I just had to learn it's okay. I, I hit like excitement, even mountain climbing. It takes, you know, a long time. And even when you get to the top, you think that's the end zone and it's not. You still got to go all the way back down. And that's when people get hurt, right, or killed. And I got challenge within itself. Yeah. So, it, you know, it's one of those things where, you know, you just got to get focused on what you want to do and just, you know, things change. People get married, have to evolve kids, put your attention towards you know, what you can do to, you know, teach the things to your children, you know, growing up. I have two girls. Um, so there's a lot of things you can do. It's just reshifting your mind towards what that's going to be and then getting the right kind of mentorship that's going to help you get to that other side. I agree. Well, Mark, you, you've achieved all these amazing things in your life. Is there anything more that you want to achieve at this point in your life? You know, I have just started. <laughs> Seriously, I've just started. I feel like I'm just accelerating right now. That, I, I, like the, putting the pedal down on the metal right now. And there's so many more mountains I want to go after. And there's so many more places around the world I want to attack. I'm in the process of writing a book um, right now, which is a whole thing. I public speak. I love going around the world and talking about that. You know, like we're talking, having this conversation today. Um, it's just fun. It's fun to meet people and their experiences. And I learn, right, too. So I don't know everything. But I know that if I have one big ass goal every year to go climb a certain mountain, and then I fill it out with these other things of you know running Sports Illustrated and writing a book, which is a whole other thing, uh, and public speaking and things like that, I know that you know I, I haven't achieved my goals like the pinnacle of success in certain things. So I know that there's still a lot of room for me to grow, and that's what I keep you know reaching for. And again, that's the whole thing: reaching for those goals. What is out there that you haven't done? What do you need to learn? How do you get better, right? And as long as you're doing that, I think you can really grow in those directions. Well, so um, awesome. how, how did you deal with uh, success and well, I've always kept it in check. I think if you ask a lot of people, I like, I was never full of myself or, you know, I don't know. It's just the way my life has, has played out. And it's just, I think when people focus so much about the past and who I was and my identity as a football player, which is what's Mark's identity as a person and the things that I want to achieve going forward, it, it's, for me at least, it's pretty easy to and quickly to forget like Mark was his football guy. That was just a period of moment in time. That's all that was. And, and so being a stand-up person, um, calling it as it is, um, being a good mentor to my kids, uh, doing things like that and achieving and going after these goals. I think when you're focused on those things out in the future, you don't have time to think about, oh, I was such a great football player. Like, who cares, right, to me? So, you know, that's, that's no, how I feel. No, no, my dad, he never, like, he hated uh, the play. He, he didn't like the game at all. I remember one time he said to me, uh, I think he was at the Boss Hall of Fame, and then, the people were just going wild. He was like, dang, oh, I, I hate this man. And, and he was just really complaining. I never heard him complain like this before. So I was looking at him, right? And he says, right before I could say it out of my mouth, he says, I know, I know, this is what I asked for. You know, but he, he hated the he, he really him. And he was a very private person. And he, and once, once it was all over, he, he loved it. I mean, he was loving it that 
uh, that you know he could go places, he could go some places, and they didn't know who he was. He he liked it that. I mean, you'll see him he'll, he'll go back to that place. You know what I'm saying? More than any other place, and nobody knew who he was. And that's one. Of, that's how he. That's how he, uh, he met his wife, and that's why he married her because he said that she didn't know who he was. Yeah, I've so enjoyed this chat with both you two. And Absolutely, uh, I think you Thank guys. You. And by the way, I love the title of your show, "Living Well on Purpose," living with purpose, living you know a purposeful life. There's a lot of ways you could say that, but you guys have nailed it. And I think that's when you start living a purpose, purpose, purposeful life, and you're looking forward and down the road at things that you want to do with intention, I think you can really try to achieve those things. So I so appreciate you guys letting me share my story. Absolutely, man. Thank you so much for your time today, Mark. Thank you for being on the show. It was an awesome conversation. Uh, would love to have you back in the future sometime. Anytime. Anytime you guys need me. Thanks for watching Living on Purpose podcast. Don't forget to like, comment, and share. Hit the subscribe button as well. See you next week.